Hi, my name is Kenny Hall. I am a soil scientist in the soil survey office located in Rosenberg, Texas. I will be discussing a digital soil survey mapping approach that we've adopted for a coastal zone soil survey of West Galveston Bay. Currently, coastal zone soil surveys are being used for habitat restoration projects such as seagrass and oyster restoration, shoreline erosion control projects, and also for dredge material. The majority of the CZSS projects are located along the East Coast, but there are a few located along the Gulf of Mexico. When we began our approach, we knew some things would need to be considered dealing with the boat. We had some training on the East Coast on the use of the Vibracore for obtaining samples, and we finally got into a rhythm using this Vibracore when COVID hit and that limited our amount of time on the boat significantly. Here are some photos of the cores we gathered in March. These are mostly sandy throughout, but a few have loamy layers lower in the profile. There is some evidence of storm events by the distribution of sands and organic matter present. Some key observations on subaqueous soils that differ from terrestrial include smell tests as well as 3 and 30 percent hydrogen peroxide tests for sulfide compounds. The presence of reduced monosulfide material is indicated by a color change of the soil immediately when 3 percent and 30 percent hydrogen peroxide is added. This is also indicated when there is a strong odor of hydrogen sulfide present. These are important indicators because if and when these soils are exposed to oxygen, potentially over time the sulfides will oxidize, pH will drop significantly, and acid sulfate will form, which renders the soil inhabitable by vegetation. This is especially relevant with the dredge material that is used for other projects. Other subaqueous soil observations include describing colors rapidly, when exposed to air because the reduced grays, blues, and green colors would quickly turn into brown or yellow. We also indicate shell fragment size and amounts and whether the soil is fluid versus non-fluid. We believe many of the sites closer to shore have a very fluid surface that is not well captured with the Vibracore, but most likely better captured with a Macaulay auger or similar. These grass areas are subaqueous, but the boat was unable to get to the sites in order to use the Vibracore. We pounded a core into the soil and extracted by hand to gather samples. And while this technically worked, it was quite slow and very difficult. Here are some cores taken in subaqueous areas closer to the mainland that had more clay in those than around the barrier island. This was expected due to the reasons for the formation of the barrier island versus the mainland. So when it came to our sampling design, I need to give credit to Alex Stum, our GIS specialist for the brains behind our approach. Some of the issues that we've had to overcome include water being a whole new ball game for us, sediment suspended in the water column. We were unaware of the landforms for the most part, there are very few visual indicators other than the shorelines. Our boat time has been limited due to weather conditions and COVID. Our time consumption, a good day would produce four soil cores. We needed a design that would help us obtain the best representative samples for the variability that exists in our landscape. This led us to use the condition Latin hypercube for our sampling design. CLHS is a near random but data driven sampling design that tries to sample features that represent the distribution of the variability across the landscape, rather than just seeking a purely random sample. The more samples you have, the closer to reality you are. CLHS distributes probable intervals across each covariate. Intervals are narrower where there is a high density of pixels but it's only as good as the covariates you have chosen to represent the landscape. 
getting covariates for the coastal zone has really proved to be a challenge. Lack of much relief and few visible indicators bring difficulty. Some that we have attempted include relative position, such as distance from the shoreline, imagery, such as LIDAR and sonar, and elevation data, such as bathymetry. Some LIDAR considerations. Light as it moves through the water column poses some challenges. Refraction, waves, turbidity, and varying tides. These factors all create limitations on LIDAR. Another option would be updated topobathymetry, which has shorter wavelength and might hopefully penetrate the water column with these challenges. Distance from various objects was a covariate that we thought could be quite useful. Ingress would be rivers, bayous, and creeks that dump sediment into the base system. Egress would be the passes that open the base system to the Gulf. These are significant because movement of sediment and water can cause geomorphic features. We believe this significance would be good to include in our sampling method, but it actually proved to produce mostly outliers rather than points within representative areas. This distribution focused better on representative areas, and we kept this one. It is important because of the different parent material. The mainland side of the bay tends to be clayier, whereas the barrier island side is sandy. This comes into play with map unit design. Relative intensities for mapping. Our first one would be tidal areas. These are quite diverse. This makes up areas from 0 to 0.58 meters water depth. This was identified using LIDAR. This depth matches tide charts, and I should note though that the tropical storms and even cold fronts can change the depth of water over these areas. The second one, shallow water areas contain geomorphic features, mostly from riptides, wave action, and fan overwashing. This area includes water depths of 0.58 to 1.58 meters. These areas will have some vegetation, but not as much ecology as tidal areas. The third, deep water areas, those were beyond 1.58 meters water depth. No plants to speak of as light does not penetrate well beyond the two meter water depth in West Galveston Bay. CLHS is the most appropriate for obscure landscapes and it seemed to fit our coastal zone soil survey projects well. It gives us the ability to stratify by different intensities of mapping, but our covariate selection is most critical. This is the display of our CLHS points. There are 100 total. We had 30 tidal, 45 shallow, and 25 deep. So some of the challenges that we continue to face most importantly, limitations to vibracoring, and this would be an access problem. Our boat drafts approximately two foot water depth and cannot get into many of the shallow areas that are one foot or less to get a vibracore. So what does this mean? We get to walk through the marsh, and this proves to be quite difficult. We have seen some discrepancies in what the CLHS point says it should be and what it actually is. Some of the shallow points are not necessarily located in shallow areas, but you could see the shallow areas in close proximity. So what does this mean? Is it a bad GPS signal, photo interpretation, the satellite imagery, and also the bathymetry that we have available is fairly coarse and not precise. And moving forward, we will continue to acquire as many points as possible and after sampling, correlate these observations, refine our covariates and run predictive models, and evaluate the model uncertainty and possibly refine our model parameters. To be determined, we'll either validate the model with split sample or conduct a smaller field campaign to gather more observations in order to independently validate our model output. Thanks, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me.